is a rather modest title, um, saying, asking the question as to whether quantum computing can help to unlock the secrets of the universe. But kind of where I want to start is to explain a little bit what I mean by the secrets of the universe. Just a quick reminder um, to ask questions and to rate um, this talk. So my story here begins at the Large Hadron Collider, which some of you may have seen um, in a talk earlier this afternoon. And this is the view that one can see um, if one is kind of flying into Geneva, which is something I do quite regularly coming from Berkeley. And the Large Hadron Collider is an enormous tunnel, 100 meters underground, and it collides protons at really high energies. And what we're trying to do there is to take the mass and the energy of the protons, smash them together, produce energy, convert that back into mass, which allows us to make new and interesting particles. And the key of this is this formula, this E equals mc squared, um, which you may have seen uh, before. So one way to think about the Large Hadron Collider is that it's a giant microscope. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to use something which is called the uncertainty principle, which means that if we can go to really, really high energy or momenta, it allows us to look at really, really small distances. And this is what you can see in that formula um, over there. And actually, we go really fast. I said these protons had lots of energy. In fact, if you think about it in terms of the speed of light, they're actually going at 0 0.9999999 times the speed of light. So really, really close. Of course, we can't quite get there, because massive particles can actually never get to the speed of um, light. Now, why are we trying to look at very, very small things? This slide here shows you a little bit of a history of how our understanding of the world has evolved from things that um, one learns about in high school, for example, atoms, which are in sizes of something like 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. But the story has just kept going. We looked inside atoms, we found nuclei. We looked inside nuclei, we found protons and neutrons. We looked inside protons and neutrons, and finally we found quarks. And as far as we know, it seems to be the case that the quarks are really elementary particles. Of course, if you look at this picture, anyone will say, are we sure that's true? Because it looks awfully convenient that it might just keep going. And that's why we want to look at these scales. We really want to try and answer some of the questions about um, really what is fundamental in nature. Now, we actually, we have a pretty good idea um, these days. And actually, this idea has become um, more firm based on some of the results that have come out of CERN. And this is something we call the standard model. And over here is a picture. And actually, this is the way I like to look at the standard model, which is showing you, probably you can't read the names, but these are all the different types of particles we actually have inside the standard model. They're kind of grouped into three sets. There are the quarks, which really make up a lot of the matter that we have around us. They are the forces, which really interact between the particles. And finally, they are the leptons, which are the other type of matter particles. I'm kind of amused because it actually turns out that my favorite diagram here comes from a movie. There was actually a movie here called Particle Fever about the discovery of the Higgs boson. And yep, they made the diagram that I think actually describes our theory of nature um, very well. If you look carefully, you can see me. I was a young grad student at the time um, working in the control room for about one second in the, in the movie. Now, of course, we're talking here about particle colliders. And so I wanted to spend just a few minutes talking about how they actually work. You might know them by their other names. Sometimes they get called atom smashers. I guess that's when we're trying to be particularly um, dramatic. And what's going on there is we have two beams of protons. And these beams are circulating inside that ring of the LHC. And we label them. We call one the red ring, the red beam, which goes one direction. And we have the blue beam, which really goes the other direction. Now, remember the picture I showed you about how small particles are? Now, imagine trying to take a 30-kilometer tunnel, putting in two protons, and trying to get them to hit each other. That's not going to work very well, right? That's really small, really big. It's going to be difficult. So actually, what we do is we don't just have one proton going around. We actually have lots of them. And these are called bunches. So we rarely put them together into large bunches of protons. And this is what my sketch is trying to indicate. Of course, I'm not showing you nearly enough. It's really many, many more. Um, particles. And then, actually, another fact, it's not really the proton that collides here. It's actually the quark inside the proton. So inside the proton, we have the quarks. And those two actually collide into each other, destroy each other, produce energy. And this will make all the particles that we're after. Now, one technical term, which I may mention, something called luminosity. This is just telling you how bright the beams are, just how strong they are. And the reason it becomes important 
is when we talk about how much data and you know, how many events we can get from a collider, it really depends on this parameter, which is known as the luminosity. Now here's a quick movie, which will hopefully play, which is actually showing you all the steps that happen inside the LHC. So we actually start here with the booster, um, which is one of the smallest rings, goes into another ring called the PS, into another ring called the SPS, and you can notice they're getting faster and faster and getting to higher energies before they finally go into the LHC itself. Now we actually zoom inside the pipe, and here you can see the dipole magnets, which actually bend the protons within the beam, and now we're looking as if we're actually one of those protons. We're kind of going along the ring, and of course where we're going to get to, now we're showing the quarks in some cartoon sitting inside our proton. What we're seeing is that up ahead is really one of the large particle detectors um, at the LHC. And now we'll slow down time a little bit, kind of zoom in really right to the center and collide them. And you can see that the, the particles we had have been destroyed and have produced a whole bunch of tracks, which actually show the information that we will actually be able to see coming out of the event. Now, that was the collider. So this is how we collide the protons together. But of course, that's not very useful if we can't really tell what's happening. So the other side of things is we actually need experiments. These are ready detectors, which can actually figure out what happened in those um, collisions. So for example, um, here is the full ring. Again, same picture I showed you before. And the two that really matter for what I'm talking about are ATLAS and CMS, <coughs> which are two general purpose detectors which are actually able to do um, all the physics um, that I'll tell you about in just a second. I work on the ATLAS experiment, so I may show you a bunch about ATLAS. Everything I say is also true for CMS. So here's a picture of the two detectors. All right, now I know no one's listening because I didn't even get a single laugh. Um, look more carefully. These are actually Lego models of the two detectors. If you look at the bottom, um, there's actually a link. One of my friends uh, made that. Here are the detectors um, for real. Um, so you can see on the left, this is Atlas. And here, this little thing here, that's a guy standing in Atlas. Here is CMS. And again, there are people standing here just to give you some scale. These are really colossal detectors. Um, at the bottom, you can see some things. For example, Atlas um, is 45 meters long, 21 meters high. And so we call Atlas the big one. Then there's CMS, which we call the heavy one, which is actually 12,000 tons. And so what you need to think about these detectors is that they're on, this, on a colossal scale, you know, really on the scale of buildings, yet at the same time, they're fabulously precise. Um, and this is what really makes it a challenge to build these detectors. Now, this next movie here is going to take a slice through one of the detectors and show you what happens as various different particles pass through. So the first one there was an electron. Remember, one of the particles within that um, standard model. The next one is a photon. And you can see between the two of them, the electron actually, um, in yellow, deposited energy in the inner detector, the sort of innermost ring, whereas the photon didn't. And that's actually how we might tell them apart. Now, I'm not going to talk about all the different particles, but you can see just visually that the characteristics of the trails that they leave are really quite different. And so this is part of figuring out what happened in event is really to figure out which particles we actually had that passed through the detector. Notice this dash track that snuck through. Actually, we also have particles that don't interact with our detector. And we can actually figure those ones out by using that conservation of energy again we really add it up to actually find out the total, and we can figure out what was actually not there. So now we've got our collisions, we've got our information, and we need to get from the detector all the way to physics. And I'm missing pieces on the slides. Um, here we go. Because we actually have quite a colossal data challenge. I talked about colliding those protons. Actually, this happens really often. In fact, we do it at a rate of 40 megahertz, OK? And we don't just do that once. We actually do that for a large fraction of the year. In fact, we do it for 6 million seconds of data taking per year. On top of that, each of our event is nice and small. It's just one megabyte, right? No problem. Sure, no problem until you multiply it by those big numbers um, that we have. And we're actually talking, if we recorded everything, which clearly we don't, we'd be talking about zettabytes 
of data per year. Everyone know what a zettabyte is? All right, I leave it as a challenge. Um, I, I had to look it up the first time I heard it because it's not used very often. Okay, so what we need to do, of course, is since we can't record that data, is we need to do a number of different things. First of all, we need to throw away everything that we don't actually need. So what we have is something called a trigger system. And the idea of this is to very quickly identify which events are interesting from which events are not interesting. Interesting, I might mean something containing a Higgs boson or something containing a dark matter particle. Not interesting would be when the protons hit and just produce a few low momentum particles. Actually, that happens most of the time. And so this is the full trigger system. I'm not going to explain it to you, but we can discuss in the questions. But what it is, it's mostly hardware, also software, and it's a, a tiered system. So at the level one, what we do is we um, keep 0.2% of the events, and we make that decision within two microseconds. The next step, this is a software trigger. Here we actually keep 1% of that future, further 0.2%, and here we have a bit more time. We actually need to make that decision within 200 microseconds. The trigger is really important. If you get this wrong, you've lost the events, right? So if you don't have a trigger, there could be new physics out there that you actually might not see. So something we have to do right. In total, um, the ATLAS experiment um, records something like 10 to the 10 raw, this means detector output, events per year. And then to do that nice pretty picture where I showed how we figured out the particles, you actually need 15 seconds per event um, to be able to reconstruct all those particles. So multiplying again, we're talking about something like 5,000 CPU years. Again, clearly, we have to do this very carefully because, again, we will not be able to do this very many times. So if you look at sort of the global picture of kind of what we have um, for computing for the LHC, um, we use something like 1 million CPU cores every hour of every day. We currently store 1,000 petabytes of data in addition, we actually make 100 petabytes of data transfers every single year. Um, and there are a couple sites here, just these are showing you, for example, um, for Atlas, actually how we do this in a distributed way across the whole world. And on the right, these are actually some of the examples of our software programs that we actually use to reconstruct the data. So that's what we do, but I haven't actually told you why um, we're doing it yet. And so now I'd like to talk about that for the next few slides. I mentioned that we have this extraordinary successful description of nature. This is the standard model with its particles. However, we can write it down very nicely, but at the same time, we can also very quickly ask questions. And they're kind of simple questions, but actually questions that at the start of the LHC, we really didn't know the answers to any of them. First one, what is the origin of particle masses? Second one, what is dark matter? Third one, why is there so much more matter than antimatter in the universe? What happened in the fourth, first few moments of the universe? Are there other forces? And so these are questions, you know, you look at the model, you think about it, these are very natural things to ask. And so these are the types of questions that we're trying to answer with the LHC. And now, of course, I want to talk a little bit about the first one, um, which is about the origin of particle masses. Now, it turns out that standard model I showed you, actually all the mathematical equations that we have would work perfectly if all the particles were massless. However, the experiments that we did told us that this was not the case. So this was a bit of an inconsistency. So there were some very smart people who predicted um, now almost 60 years ago something which is called the Higgs boson, which is actually can be regarded in, in many ways as a mathematical trick. What it actually allows us to do is to be able to have the particles be massless when we need them to be, so really to satisfy the equations, yet at the same time to undergo a process that allows them to have mass when we measure them. And so that's what I mean by a trick. It's kind of satisfying two different things. And actually, the Higgs boson was the simplest way that you could modify the theory to do this. Now in the detector, I showed you how we see whatever particles are going through. But of course, we're not interested in measuring electrons and muons and things like that. We, we know them pretty well. We want to see things like the Higgs. Unfortunately, the Higgs is a highly unstable elementary particle. It actually hangs around only for 1.6 times 10 to the minus 22 seconds. 
you should be remembering that zeta byte I was telling you about. We're talking the same order, the other direction. So we're talking a really short fraction of time. So the way that you actually see the Higgs boson is by seeing what it decays to, so studying its remnants. And for example, here, this is saying you'd look at two photons, and you want to actually figure out that those two photons really came from the Higgs boson. And of course, for this, you would use those detectors I was telling you about. Now, this is actually um, what a candidate Higgs event would look like, for example, in the Atlas detector. Um, it's kind of showing you here, this is sort of a 3D view. And here, we're kind of slicing down through the middle of the detector. Um, and you can see in red here, these are four um, muons, as it turns out, that this Higgs boson um, event has decayed to. You can also see there's a whole lot of junk around. This is always the case. It would be way simpler if we just had a Higgs and nothing else. Uh, unfortunately, it's not that simple. And now I want to show you two kind of little videos. And what these are actually showing you is the real plots. So these are how we actually measure particles at the LHC. And what it's actually showing you is just as time went on, so you can see the time at the top right, how the events actually came in at what mass of a particle they showed up at. So I'll show it now, and you kind of want to watch it. This is um, looking at diphoton events. And you can watch it growing. As we get more data, we get more events. Looks pretty, you know, pretty standard. <coughs> and you can see the measure at the top sort of showing you where it is. And now you start to see there's a little bump that starts to appear. And then finally, you know, we got to the end of the, the data that we wanted, and you actually do a fit. And that actually is one of the plots that was used to determine the Higgs boson. Now, I will show it one more time, because I want you this time to think about it. At what point are you confident that there's something there? Because this is really how it was, right? We were recording the data, looking at the plot. At what point do you actually decide that there's some new particle there versus some you know, fluctuation in the data? Of course, we have statistical standards that we use, but it really is something um, quite difficult. Here's another video, pretty similar. This one is looking at the Higgs decaying to two Z bosons and then four leptons. Um, and this one has a lot less background. So it's a little bit easier to see the Higgs. It looks a bit different. The background isn't nicely and smooth like in the other case that I had. And here again, you can watch the events coming in. And this time, you'll know which mass you should be looking at in the plot because it's the same one as the previous one. And now you can start to see how the Higgs boson actually appears as we got more and more data um, coming in. And so I like to show those videos just to show you really how it looks and how one actually sees it. <coughs> and this was what led to um, a seminar that was held at CERN on the 4th of July 2012, which is why I like to call it Higgs Independence Day. Uh, I think that's wrong. It um, should be called Higgs Dependence Day because, of course, we found the Higgs boson. And this was a really exciting day because both experiments showed the results that they had. And for me, that was when I kind of knew it was real. Of course, I knew there were rumors about CMS. But really seeing their data, seeing that their plots look just like ours, showed a particle at the same mass, at this point it really gave me confidence that we knew what we were doing. And of course, this resulted in the Nobel Prize for the two theorists, um, Peter Higgs and Francois Engler, um, in 2013. So the LHC has actually answered one of those questions um, that I've talked about, but we're not done. All these other questions here, they remain unanswered just the same. So one way that one can continue, of course, one can think of new ideas, new experiments. The other solution is, of course, there's going to be a whole lot more data. It's actually early days for the LHC. So it's a complicated plot. I don't want you to try and understand it. Um, it's not really worth the time. But basically, I want you to look at the blue curve. And you can see here the different years. So here's where we are in 2019. That's how much data we have. This blue curve up here, that's how much data we're going to get from the LHC by the end of its lifetime, which is in um, 2038. And so we've actually only had 5% of the data that we um, will be getting. But to get there, we actually need to do a major upgrade. We need to really change the accelerator. And this is something which is called the high luminosity LHC, or HLLHC. And in the sketch on the right, this is just sort of illustrating all the important changes that are needed um, to get there. Now, the high luminosity LHC is great for physics. But it's quite a challenge for computing. And that's kind of what I'm going to talk about now um, for the rest of the talk. Firstly, let's have a look at some of those events again. So here, we're actually looking at how things looked when we got the first data from the LHC, pretty nice and easy, versus how they might look for the high luminosity LHC. 
And don't be fooled, I did say, you know, that lots of those tracks weren't important, you know, that we didn't care about them as much as maybe the Higgs boson. We actually need to find each one of those because any one of them might be the one that we're actually after. And algorithmically, we're talking about something that naively scales like n um, factorial. In terms of the data volumes, um, this was a plot shown earlier, but I like it, so I'm going to show it again. This is actually showing you here um, how much data the LHC had in 2016 compared to various other things ongoing, you know, the internet archive, Facebook uploads, another experiment, which is called SKA. And here is actually showing you what we're talking about for high luminosity LHC. We're talking about an exabyte um, of physics data. On top of that, as many of you will know, there are some changes in the technology. And these actually don't turn out to be particularly friendly for the type of um, computing that we want. I mean, we of course still have more scaling, but what one can see is that the single thread performance has started dropping off. And what's really happening is we're ending up with computers with many more logical cores um, than before. And this is maybe a way that um, we like to look at things. This is how it used to be for us. This is kind of how it is today. And this is looking at you know, how things are evolving towards the future. And this actually makes it even more challenging for us to meet our goals. So maybe this plot um, is kind of going to summarize um, where we are. Again, showing you the years. So we're over here today. And what you want to look at is you want to look at the black line. This is what our budget's going to give us in terms of CPU power as a function of years. And in blue are various different estimates about how we actually might try and get to our budget. Actually, in gray, can you see it right at the top here of the, of the plot? That's actually if we were using the computing model from 2017. So this is um, all assuming that we make various improvements to kind of get us closer. But nonetheless, we're not there. And actually, being able to really reconstruct and store all this data is going to be really a major challenge for us at the high luminosity LHC. And so that's why some of us have been asking questions. You know, what other options might there be? And here's something far on the speculative side. Um, and the question that we want to ask is, could quantum computing somehow play a role um, in, in helping us solve this problem? Now, the initial ideas about quantum computing, those are actually pretty old. Um, I'm, I was a Caltech student, so you have to forgive me if I show you at least one picture of Richard Feynman. Um, but actually, he was one of the first to propose quantum computers. So this was way back in 1982, um, so a long time ago. And he said the idea was a little bit different. He said, let the computer itself be built of quantum mechanical elements which obey quantum mechanical laws. And so what he was thinking about here was if you want to actually make computers simulate quantum systems, it might be easier to make the computer itself quantum, because then you'll naturally get all the effects that you're actually um, after. Now, um, we're almost 40 years later. And I remember learning about um, quantum computing you know, when I was studying at, at university. And it sounded super cool, but it also sounded like it was impossibly far away. However, over the past few years, things seem to be in shifting because actually there are a number of what you might call prototype or you know, growing quantum computers around. And here are just two examples. Um, this is the IBM uh, 20Q Tokyo chip. The 20, of course, is telling you that it has 20 qubits. Um, and then there's an example on the right from D-Wave, which has the 2,000 qubits. Of course, there are very different qubits between the two of them, so you shouldn't be comparing the two numbers. But these are the types of quantum computers that are available to now today um, that one can actually use to develop algorithms. And so we've been exploring you know, how we might actually use them in particle physics. And as these are small quantum computers, as these are really new ideas, um, most of these are really ideas. I'm not going to show you final results. I'm certainly not going to show you, you know, numbers about how they solve the computing problem. That, that's, not, that's not what we're after. It's really about the idea stage. And of course, if anyone has ideas about what other things we could be doing, we'd, be, we'd love to talk about that. So one of them is that when we produce these particles um, at the LHC, we actually need to make a whole lot of simulation, which we use to develop our analyses, understand our detectors, and even you know, actually do the physics studies themselves. And when we do that, this is a little bit how an event might look like. So when you collide those two protons together, 
produce a whole bunch of particles and then they shower and all sorts of complicated physics processes ongoing until you really see the final particles in your detector. The idea there, what we do right now, is we take each of these to be fully independent. So you have one particle, it'll decay to the others, and you just keep going in a tree, very simple. But that's not true. These are quantum mechanical particles, so they, of course, have correlations between each other, which is described by quantum mechanics. And so that's the idea. What one wants to do is to really get the particles to really obey quantum mechanics, to really have the correlations um, between them described correctly. And what we can do here is to exploit entanglement between qubits on a quantum computer and use this to describe a parton shower. So here um, is actually a demonstrator of a quantum circuit, um, sort of following this idea. If you're interested, I put a link um, at the bottom to the paper um, which is describing it. And this is something that could be very interesting and is also along the lines of the ideas from Feynman about how one might actually want to use a quantum computer. Another idea. Remember I've talked a bit about, I've mentioned tracks from time to time. I haven't really told you what a track is, I've just mentioned it. All a track is, is when you have a particle passing through one of your silicon detectors, it actually leaves these little dots of energy. When you join them up, that actually is a track, which is meant to simply represent where the particle actually went through the detector. And this picture, where you see all the millions and millions of green lines, those are all the tracks that we actually want to reconstruct at the high luminosity LHC. Now here's another plot, uh, again showing you how much CPU time we need to reconstruct tracks. And here's some parameter. I don't want to go into details of what it is. But what I can tell you now is we're here today. This is where we are. And high luminosity LHC is way off the edge of my plot. So my plot goes up to 100. You should really think about going all the way up to 140 or 200 and try extrapolating the plot on the left there to see what value. So what you can see here is the growth of this algorithm is quite frankly awful, such that we're going to be needing to use the, a large burgeon of CPU at the high luminosity LHC to be able to reconstruct um, tracks. And so here what we're after is thinking about whether quantum computers can use different algorithms. So one different algorithm would actually use something called associative memory. So normally what we're doing, right, is we have those hits on the track. Let me actually go back to that slide. And what you're really trying to do is you're trying to process and find each of the tracks one by one. This is, this is the algorithms we use today. In associative memory, on the other hand, what you do is you make an enormous lookup table of all the possible patterns and the tracks that they compare to. And then your time becomes quick. You just need to do a lookup. Well, quick, um, a lot quicker. You just need to look up the pattern that actually matches to the track. And this is something actually we're trying out right now in one of our trigger detectors um, for, our, for our current um, detector. But the problem is, once you go to high luminosity LHC, you end up needing a lot of patterns to be able to do it. And here's where quantum associative memory might be interesting, because you can actually end up, you have the potential for exponential storage capacity um, to be able to find the tra these tracks. And so this is what the plot's showing. Here's showing you the number of bits that you want to um, can store. This is showing you the number of memory units that you have. In orange, you can see standard associative memory. And in blue, you can actually see what you'd be able to get with quantum associative memory. Please note that the scale here is logarithmic. So the growth in what you're actually able to store is really a lot um, bigger. So for this, we've done a demonstrator of this algorithm on IBM Q. It's just for a two-bit pattern, so much simpler than what we really need. And you can see here <coughs> the circuit to generate the pattern and the circuit to retrieve the pattern. And if you look here, if you're interested in more details, please have a look at that um, paper. Another idea is to use quantum annealing. And here what is done, again, is to reformulate the track reconstruction problem. But instead, what you do is you actually find a way to describe the different tracks in terms of energy. And it can become an energy minimization problem, which is a really natural task to run on D-Wave. Essentially, this is what one can run on, um, these quantum annealers. The advantage here is that 
this solution time is not going to really scale with the number of tracks in the same way because you're just trying to minimize one energy solution. Of course, your energy function gets more complicated, so it's not saying it's fully independent, but you expect it to see much better um, scaling time. And this is actually all the steps that are really used inside the algorithm. And this is just one example of an event, um, kind of showing you what it looks like. And what you kind of want to pay attention to are the green tracks, this dark green. These are the real tracks that you've really managed to reconstruct. The red ones are the fakes that you've made mistakes on, and the blue ones are the ones that you've actually missed. Um, and if you look maybe a bit more quantitatively here, this is actually showing you as, uh, depending on how dense your event is, like how many particles are there, it of course makes the problem harder or easier, you can look at the efficiency. So this is how often do I reconstruct a track I want to see. The purity, which is how often do I get it wrong. You can see that at and this is where we are, by the way, today at the current LHC. Here we do really excellently in terms of purity and efficiency. And we keep our efficiency pretty well up to high luminosity LHC, but we currently have issues um, with the purity. Um, and then this is ongoing research um, to figure out what could be done. Then the last idea is how can one actually use quantum computers to help to find that Higgs boson? that I was telling you about. And by the way, this is another one of the real events. This one is actually showing you what the Higgs boson looks like um, inside CMS. And here, what you're actually seeing are two photons. So one photon going up here, one photon going down here, some other tracks, and some extra energy um, which is deposited in the, in the detectors. Of course, as I showed you before, this is really not how we actually end up looking at our data. Of course, we look at our data a lot more like this. In fact, that's not even the whole story, right? Because what we do is we actually count up all the events, but then we need to actually decide, you know, how many of our events look like a Higgs boson and how many look like the background. The example I show you here is a really easy one. You can see the peak, right? We could easily say that's where they are, but sometimes, the events that look like the particle we are after and the events from the background can really look quite similar to each other. And so then it becomes more challenging. And so then I could give you a whole different talk about telling you how machine learning has really transformed um, how we do physics. Um, there was actually a really nice um, paper about that in Nature um, a few years ago, sort of showing the gains. And that's really how we actually do it. We actually use machine learning, which can actually, of course, very naturally pick out whatever signal we're after out of the various um, different backgrounds. So the idea here was, OK, let's combine everything. Let's try to actually do the machine learning to find a Higgs boson on a quantum computer. <laughs> so put everything all together. And this is what's been done. Um, there's a nice paper. Um, you can see it in, in nature. Unfortunately, the plots are, oh, it's got cut off. OK, so let's first look at the plot on the left here. This is looking, this is a standard rock curve, of course. You're looking here at your signal acceptance versus your background rejection. And the one you want to actually look at is the one that's super hard to see, which is actually the quantum annealer, which is in green. It's kind of actually hiding here just behind the blue line. And what these other ones are are various different techniques that are actually commonly used for machine learning um, in particle physics. And so what you can see essentially is there's no major gain, but it doesn't do worse. That's kind of the message of the plot. However, what's maybe more interesting is if you look at the plot on the right here, what this one is showing you is, again, the area under those curves, just as a measure of you know, how well are the various techniques doing. And it's looking as a function of the size of the training um, data set. And again, here, I want you to look at the quantum annealer, which is the guy in green. And what you can actually notice is that there's actually sort of two very different behaviors. What happens is that the, initially, the quantum annealer goes well, quite well, then it kind of plateaus off, whereas the other techniques, all these deep learning techniques, they actually end up improving the performance um, further. And so I think this tells us a few things. I mean, maybe it's telling us that you know, it can learn something on small data sets more easily. Maybe it's telling us we need to do something more sophisticated on the quantum computing side. These are the various um, different options that there might be. And that actually um, brings me to, to the end. Um, so yeah, I've tried to show you um, some hints about how the first 10 years of the LHC 
have been highly successful. And really one of the highlights um, that we had was the exciting discovery of a new particle, um, which was the Higgs boson. And we have this exciting upgrade, which is the high luminosity LHC, which could provide answers to many outstanding questions in physics. However, it doesn't come without challenges. We really do have a significant computing challenge ahead, which will allow us to process the data needed for physics analysis. At the moment, because of this, many new ideas and paradigms are being actively explored, and I have not covered them um, at all um, in this talk. Rather, what I've done is try to sort of show you one of them and to ask the question, and it's really still at the question stage, about whether quantum computing might be able to play a role. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.